in the course of my uh, teaching, I do composition workshops, and I've, I've taught them in a number of parts of the country. Uh, and um, one question, uh, I mean, our process is such that I have people organize a, you know, a group of figures just because I want to talk about the storytelling qualities. When you group figures, can you group them in such a way that the narrative that you're trying to portray is on there? And as I say, every time you do a representation, uh, I don't care if it's a screwdriver in a vase, you're still going to be saying something, right? There's going to be a narrative component. So you have to think about that and see what you're doing. But so when you group three figures, which I try to do, overlap, learn, learn to overlap figures, learn to group them as, uh, so that they look well together, but they also tell their story, right? But the look well together, look good together part is really about, um, is the aesthetic, it's a visual aesthetic, right? So we do things like talk about patterning. When this group gets together, does it make an intriguing pattern? And, uh, uh, and does it, are the figures placed well and are they good sizes in relation to each other so that, uh, so they're aesthetically pleasing. And uh, and then we go from there. We make that. We say, let let that be the center of interest, or at least a key part of the center of interest, the beginning of the center. And we use that to evolve the background. But this question here uh, comes from a composition workshop participant, a, a recent one, and she said, I think it was she, in your workshops, you've shown how you evolve a composition from the center of interest, but have you also described, but you have also described... Uh, Gamel, Pleisner, and Jerome putting the figures, the center, into a landscape or architectural setting. Uh, is there an absolute best way, or how do you determine when to do that, and what difficulties you might be involved, what might be involved, whatever your decision? So uh, that came out of uh, this image came up here. We had been talking about the center of interest, and uh, and I showed uh, I showed people the. Um, the underlying main line of this composition, which you can plainly see, is these grand sweeping uh, diagonals uh, uh, coming out of the background and up through the front or backwards, whatever you want to say, the sort of the, 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 the sweeping perspective lines. And uh, the counter line being those verticals. And it's a very elegant, very beautiful line. Uh, and you can see the center of interest is stacked on that line, the essence of it, that vertical figure in the middle is stacked on that line. Everything about that is um, um, correlated with the main line, the counter line. But in the case of Jerome, it does appear, and that's why the question came up, it does appear that Jerome, and we know that he, in fact, put up <laughs> um, or had architectural backgrounds in which he incorporated figures. He did it in the Orientalist pictures um, in the Near East. He did it... Uh, repeatedly in historic painting, you know, history paintings in, um, from France. Uh, and um, uh, there's no question that he had, he, I mean, he had an architectural draftsman, you know, create, recreate in this next shot image here. The upper left, that Versailles, that, that building no longer existed. He had an architect uh, do him drawings for that thing so he could create that building for this uh, uh, story. I think it's uh, the king may be receiving a um, an ambassador or whatever. I apologize for forgetting the title of this thing. It's uh, sloppy on my part, but nevertheless, you can see that in all three of these cases here, he had architectural settings, and he wasn't simply making a center of interest and then gluing them on, but he appears to have created this, the architectural settings and then managed the proportions and the placement and the and the gesture of the central groupings. And um, uh, and that process works perfectly fine. I found that with uh, still life, it's much students have a very difficult time getting great centers of interest, and so I try to get them to work the other way in those kinds of pictures. Get them to go ahead and uh, and just learn how to create a great, a fascinating area, and then and then work out from there. But in reality, of course, there's no problem. I used to, in fact, the best one, the best picture that I did as an early student, I simply had a piece of a rug and it created its own phenomenon, which I placed my figure. So there is no decision like that that you must make. Uh, and it does uh, have to do with best, uh, with the necessities of the situation and what works best for you. But I say necessity is the situation. So Gamo did this series called The Hounds of Heaven in which they're all really tall verticals. And he's designing these things uh, rather abstractly first. I mean, you can, and he talks about it actually to me, about what he does, smudges around a bunch of middle tones. 
Uh, let me show you this Rembrandt. See the bottom Rem picture there? That that Rembrandt has, you know, like you could, you, he, it clearly is from the same kind of a setting. By the way, the Raphael above, the the uh, Degas on the right, same thing, right? They have architectural settings and they're, and they're incorporating figures into them. I think you know, as much as he's the great god of composition, Raphael's picture is far less successful than almost all the other ones I've shown you. But of course, everybody else had his shoulders to stand on, so um, that's a pretty big deal. But the, the uh, Rembrandt is a nice example of how Gamel might have, you know, this setting is a, is, <laughs> let me finish what I'm saying, how Gamel might have evolved this with just blobs. How he might have looked at the setting and said, all right, so here, here's, a, here's a rectangle. Let's, let's just smear in some of these lights and see where the game is. You know what I'm saying? And then having seen that, the larger masses of those lights, he can then say, let's put the, put the central figures right here. And uh, as I said, and, and, and by the way, as he said, in the conversation, and then you put those figures in, and you say, oh yeah, I think I have an idea for a story, you know, for a narrative. <laughs> it's very fun. I like the way that he's actually thinking that to whatever degree he's, in, in that conversation with us, he was putting that last. Uh, you can, you, if you listen to the rest of my videos, you know why that amuses me. <laughs> but it's far more important from our point of view that you actually know how to create a, a, a visual delight uh, than it is to preach some some great philosophy at me or tell me some history when you're not a historian or a philosopher, right? <laughs> you know, don't you know? Stick to your last uh, cobbler, right? So, um, but again, these are just really nice examples where you can see that um, the evolution. What I like about the Degas, I mean, the evolution from of a toward a center from a larger abstraction. What I like about the Degas um, is is we, I've seen some other drawings of a figure like this one, and, and they, there appear to be some drawings that uh, came out of his um, uh, experience watching this sort of a circus carnival. This woman is being apparently lifted by her teeth, you know, holding her, gripping, gripping something in her teeth. And uh, so her arms and legs would be free to do whatever. Uh, but you can see that as he looked up, the architectural lines of the building did this interesting diagonal thing. I've talked about this with you before. But what you can see is that he actually said, and let's listen to that. And so the reverse happens. When you create a center of interest, you expect the background to listen to your center of interest. In this case, you're forced to try, or it makes tons of sense, to get your center of interest to listen in its own lines to the longer lines, to the greater lines of the architectural setting. So in this architectural setting, here's this great counterline thing, right, that I described to you in that early one with these kinds of zigs and zags. And there she's doing pretty much the same thing, counter lines and the whole entire operation she's got going on is the same as the, uh, as the architecture below. But that's just the conversation about how one listens to the other. And that's how it has to go. Uh, the last thing, uh, not the last thing, uh, the upper one here is uh, the Versailles. Uh, it's one of the First World War, the treaties. And uh, Joseph de Camp, I've showed you this before. Uh, this is a study for a picture. And, but you can see that he's worked up the entire setting. He obviously was going to paint that. He had decided that his pictorial uh, amusement, or the, what he believed would be pictorially most fascinating for people, incorporated that, that entirety of that wall, gave grandeur to the entire event. And, uh, and so the placement of these dots of lights down at the bottom became these, if you want to call it that, rather like accents. So there's this whole domination of the entire background and, and, the, and the figures, much like in the uh, previous one with uh, uh, Raphael, these figures are just minor elements, relatively speaking. Uh, but that's again the, where the background is the setting and everything else is stuffed in, uh, worked in. Ang is doing it here, uh, something, some, some religious thing related to the Sistine Chapel. You can see a uh, nice opportunity, by the way, for someone who really wants a reason to copy part of the Sistine uh, paintings, some of the Sistine paintings or something like that. But uh, this would have been the same thing. You will find yourself looking at these walls, and he had access to them, so he could walk around, find a really good angle on these walls, do some drawings, and then picture where he would place. Or this might have already been incorporated there, but where, the, where you'd place your center of interest in, the, in relation to these things. You then have the problem of creating a really terrific center of interest with it. With this, uh, beautifully incorporates. Uh, but you know, so there's nothing really exciting to talk about. This should be self-evident what I'm talking about. 
The one thing, um, the other quote I use is the one by, by Ogden Pleisner. Pleisner was a uh, New York trained painter, the Art Students League actually way early on. <laughs> he, was a, he was something like 10 years younger than Gamble and friends with Gamble. So we had a chance to meet him uh, in the 70s. But um, he said his idea was, so if these were landscapes, uh, you know, there were landscapes that were sitting out there, right? And uh, so he, he would be painting these landscapes, and he said, so you'd say, well, there's the setting, right? This landscape is the setting. Uh, and then he would say, uh, and then if somebody asked me to put a figure in, if I chose to put a figure in, and he was a hunting guy, he, he liked, he eventually he was doing a lot of hunting type stuff, he would say, well, I'd just go to the center of interest, and I'd put the figure right there. And now, and that just has to do with the center of interest as the figure, as the abstractions sit, just as you look at the picture, your eyes are drawn to here first. And uh, so that, as it were, is already a center of interest. And he's made it more interesting by putting a human into it, much the same as what he's done with this one. But you can see that's a, just sort of a, you know, yeah, once you have a setting, it's a question of where you're going to put it. And if you put the figure in the wrong place, you're going to have a competing center because humans have this enormous weight, whether they have visual weight or not, they have an enormous tendency to have an enormous weight, unless they're shrunken to nothing. But um, anyway, no more than that. So I just wanted to say that work it either way. Don't, don't, don't feel like it's, uh, e you know, just, just understand that they are in communication with each other. The whole, the whole field is working with the center, and the whole center is, you know, is, 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 a, is either a product of or is a, um, or is a the, or the creator of the uh, events that happen in the field. So, all right, good. Uh, so yeah, do well if you uh, have any if you have any inclination to drag me out to your location. Uh, I'm eager to to share the compositional ideas that I have in these workshops, and uh, just let me know. All right. Uh, all right. So do uh, subscribe, uh, comment, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. See you next time.